Okay, I went to Blue Letter Bible and I searched prayer and fasting. And I came up with uh, these five verses. Matthew 17, 21 says, How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So that means this is the only way to, uh, uh, to do this thing is but by prayer and fasting. And Mark 9, 29, And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing, but prayer and fasting. Notice the by nothing. So this is the only way that certain things happen. The only other verse that has the words fasting and prayer, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 5 in the New Testament, is uh, talking about a husband and wife just taking time uh, to fast and pray. Now on Mark 9.29, uh, 9, notice if uh, we go to BibleHub.com that the NIV leaves out fasting in Mark 9.29. Uh, the New Living Translation leaves it out. And the English Standard Version leaves out fasting in Mark 9.29. But they all admit that there's only one way to do it. So the question is, does fasting belong or doesn't it in that verse? In his article, How Badly Did the Early Scribes Corrupt the New Testament? Uh, Daniel Wallace, uh, a known textual critic, says about Mark 9.29, um, if we go down here, that the earlier manuscripts don't have and fasting, but most of the manuscripts which are later do have and fasting. This is a meaningful variant and a viable variant, and it is the only place in the New Testament that says that fasting may be required to exercise demons. So this is meaningful and viable and it is important whether fasting is in there or not. Okay, let's look at fasting, um, the text of the Gospels, um, James Snap's article on Mark 9.29 with uh, uh, some early external evidence. There's, there's different evidences in here, and let's have a look at that. Now, James Snap uh, says... Uh, uh, talks about Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, but uh, and he says that they're from about 325 and 350, but they are not our earliest Greek witness to the text of Mark 9:29. Papyrus 45 is older by a century or slightly more. He says that UBS 4 apparatus lists P45 as a support for the inclusion of and fasting. And James Snap uh, notes, uh, I think this is a, a replica of the manuscript, and uh, when you look at the space, he says, however, space considerations virtually require that on um, that it would be followed by a blank space for the word fasting, which seems uncharacteristic of the practice of the manuscript's copyist. Then James Snap goes to De Virginitate, which is called Pseudo Clement's Second Epistle on Virginity, and he considers it a witness in support of uh, the fuller reading, which includes uh, fasting in Mark 9.29, and also for the inclusion of Matthew 17.21. Um, there's an English translation, and there's a link on his uh, article, and he gives an excerpt, this kind goes not out, but by fasting and prayer. And then, with fasting and with prayer, and by your fastings and prayers. 
Finally, uh, Brother James concludes, the exact composition date of De Virginitate is debatable, but inasmuch as Jerome referred to it around 393 in his work against Jovianus, um, regarding it as a genuine work of Clement, which is earlier, and Epiphanus used it, uh, composed in the 370s. So these are additional evidences that fasting uh, should be included. If we looked at the hermeneutics, biblical hermeneutics stack exchange on fasting in Mark 9.29, and we see this person um, down here uh, list various witnesses to include um, fasting. And the oldest potential Greek witness um, agrees basically with what Brother Snap said, uh, it looks like. And it also says that Latin witnesses um, range from 2nd to 5th century, showing the reading is just as old as what's in Aleph and B. Now at Blue Letter Bible we can see Matthew seventeen twenty one, howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting, is totally omitted by the New Living Translation, the NIV, and the ESV. So let's ask ourselves, should they have omitted Matthew seventeen twenty one? It is interesting that the Net Bible has Matthew seventeen twenty one. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, does the Net Bible have any credibility? Well, if um, Kenneth Barker from the NIV Study Bible said regarding to the Net, the translator's notes, study notes, and text critical notes um, alone are worth the price of the Net Bible. In our work on the fully revised NIV, we consulted the Net Bible notes and were often helped by them. Wayne Grudem, lead editor of the ESV, said the extensive and reliable notes in the Net Bible were a wonderful help to our translation team as we worked to prepare the English Standard Version. So you see that the Net Bible is a respectable Bible and includes that verse while the NIV and the ESV left it out. If we go to the Biblical her Hermeneutic Stack Exchange, uh, according to um, this person's comment, according to Constantine Tischendorf's Critical Apparatus, page 103, footnote for verse 21, based on Tischendorf's Critical Apparatus, it seems that the majority of witnesses support the inclusion of Matthew 17.21. So the person asks, on what basis does Nestle Alon 28th edition and various other modern manuscripts omit Matthew 17, 21? So I found this article at academia.edu on the authenticity and interpretation of Matthew 17, 21. And we'll, we'll go through the important points in this article on why 17, 21 should be included. In fact, this author says, if reasons for rejecting it are insufficient, rejecting the verse, then the verse's implications for Christian faith and practice should be revisited. Indeed, while internal arguments against Matthew 17:21 may appear formidable at first sight, deeper examination suggests that they are overstated at best and merely conjectural, conjectural at worst. In other words, the arguments against having Matthew 17, 21 may appear good at first, but actually are, uh, in this author's, Jonathan Borland's suggestion, not good. All right, so let's look at the evidences in this article. So the external evidence for Matthew 17, 21 for including the verse is 99.4% of all Greek manuscripts, including three from the 5th century, 
three from the sixth, that's, you know, CDW from the fifth, OSF from the sixth, one from the seventh, two from the eighth, nine from the ninth, and also the important Lake and Farrar groups whose archetypes go back to the fourth century. The lectionary system supports its inclusion. Versional support for the verse is striking. Most old Latin manuscripts, including Versalensis of the fourth century, Ver Veronensis, Beze, Corbiensis, two, and the St. Gallen manuscripts, all from the 5th century, and offer important witnesses. The Vulgate, the Syriac Peshitta, and Harklensis, the Middle Egyptian Codex Skoyan, circa 350, and part of the Boharic, part of the Georgian, the Armenian, the Ethiopic, and the Old Church Slavonic, Lastly, important church fathers representing a broad provenance had the verse in their copies, including Origen, possibly Clement of Alexandria in the 3rd century, Juventus, Asterius, Hilary, Basil of Caesarea, Ambrose, and Chrysostom in the 4th, and Jerome and Augustine in the 5th. Notice Pseudo Clement, which dates to uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 AD. Uh, although it is questioned its authenticity, it quotes uh, the verse by saying, of, of our Lord, who hath said, This kind goeth not out but by fasting and prayer. So it's explicitly in that document that. Uh, uh, is thought to date back to 100 to 200 A.D. Tertullian, 215 A.D., says clearly supports the Byzantine text of either Matthew 17:21 or Mark 9:29. By the way, that would indicate that the Byzantine text may very well be older than Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. He says clearly in there, he also taught to fight against the more fierce demons by means of fasting. And the places you find that are Matthew 17, 21 and Mark 9, 29. Notice Origen in 250 AD, he says, uh, Origen's significance as a witness for the presence of Matthew 17, 21 cannot be understated since his commentarium in Evangelium Matthei not only represents an explicit reference to Matthew, but also predates by a full century any evidence of any kind that omits the passage. Origen says that those then who suffer from what is called lunacy sometimes fall into the water is evident, and that they also fall into the fire. Less frequently indeed, yet it does happen, and it is evident that the disorder is very difficult to cure, so that those who have the power to cure demoniacs sometimes fail in respect of this, and sometimes with fastings and supplications more toils succeed. And in the same work, work he says, but let us also attend to this, this kind goeth not out, save by prayer and fasting. Uh, so there it is, explicitly, the, the part about prayer and fasting, and it dates back to 250 A.D., well before Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Uh, Juventus in 330 A.D. Uh, is before Jerome's Vulgate, and it proves the presence of Matthew 17:21 in old Latin copies as far away as Spain by the early 4th century. And just to look at the end of this author's article, uh, John Mill uh, uh, in 1707, um, Daniel Whitby in 1724, John Albrecht Bengel in 1734. 
Uh, Christian Friedrich von Mattei in 1788. Griesbach in 1796 brings it up. His first argument is narrative consistency. And he seems to say that something extra uh, is implied by the way the text is worded. And fasting would make sense as that extra in addition to prayer. Um, some people argue that the fasting was included to make the verses match. And that's reasonable, so that's an argument for both sides here. Um, verbal dissimilarity also argues for the fact that fasting did belong there. And some people argue that fasting was written in uh, because it was in the other verse. So uh, this uh, verbal dissimilarity really goes for both sides. I'm not sure about the intrinsic probability of acceptive language in Matthew, uh, so I'll skip that. Uh, here, he argues relative consistency of the passage in the manuscript tradition by saying, concluding, nevertheless, in this case, the absence of significant variation only reinforces a strong presumption in favor of the verse's authenticity. It may have been omitted in some manuscripts by accident. Now, harmonization. He notes, uh, in fact, the very omission of the saying from Luke's version of the story, which more closely follows Matthew's account, is prima facie evidence against the notion that no one would have deleted a text of such popular appeal. If Luke himself was willing to part with the saying, why not a single early scribe or editor? Now, on... Um, Eusebius, uh, we note that he says, Regard regardless the zeal of modern critics to use Eusebius as evidence against the verse, against the warnings of the early masters of New Testament textual criticism is enough to warrant the suggestion that the same notion could have occurred to the ancient scribe or critic especially considering Eusebius' widespread and acknowledged distinction in that day, to omit the phrase in Matthew to account of an erroneous interpretation of the Eusebian canons. In other words, uh, Eusebius may have influenced uh, the verse's omission in some places. All right, he gives other arguments here. Um, reasons why it might have been removed uh, from the manuscripts. All right, so we've seen that there's plenty of manuscript evidence for the inclusion of prayer and fasting. Not only that, but the patristic testimony predates Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, Aleph and B. So that we have evidence going back, uh, looks like about 100 years even before those manuscripts. And we see consistent testimony um, through many years for its inclusion. And there does not seem to be actually a very good reason to omit it, except based on Aleph and B. So this really does show an overemphasis on Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus over all the other manuscripts and patristic testimonies, which, by the way, should tell you that um, modern textual critics do an injustice by omitting the various um, patristic testimonies uh, in their arguments for inclusion or for exclusion. Thank you.